So hey, Anya, Hi. how are you? Good, good. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well. We're, we're both in quarantine in Philadelphia here. Um, yes. And, you know, like everyone else, I mean, things are looking a little more, uh, a little more hopeful, I guess, with, with the vaccines, possible right. promising vaccines coming and at the same time, all sorts of other things happening, which, you know, we won't, you know, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. Uh, yeah. But we don't have to talk about that. We're here to talk about music and to get to know you, our, our composer for the Winter Baroque concert, just a bit. Um, yes. Now, you've got quite a, I'm trying to remember, quite an interesting background. Um, but, you know, actually, before we get to that, so you'll be giving just a little bit of an introduction about the piece during the streamed concert. So the streamed concert is... December 20th? 20th, which is Sunday at 3 o'clock. Okay. It's being recorded earlier in St. Paul's in Newburyport. And it'll be Nurit Pacht again, uh, playing violin, along with Eliana Yang on cello, continuo. Uh, Nurit's doing, I think, a Veracini sonata oh. for violin for solo violin. Uh, um, Great. That got changed from the Bieber. Uh, so Veracini. And then Eliana's going to play a Bach suite, a solo Bach suite, cello suite. We'll do a couple of canons by Bach, uh, and then we'll have this this world premiere. So uh, during the during the concert, we'll have just a little five minute interlude when you'll be having a little discussion about the piece. So without giving too much away, uh, do you want to just give just a little bit of background about what this? what this world premiere is, is going to be like. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people are like, okay, great, you know, world premiere concert. And then they're like, uh, I mean, world premiere on the Baroque concert. And they're like, how does that work? You know, Bach died in, in what was it? Uh, 1750? 1750, right. Uh, you know, Vericini, and then, you know, how, how does the Baroque piece work? Uh, and a world premiere, unless it's, you know, unless it's something that's just been discovered in some attic somewhere, but we know it's not. So yeah, just give us a little idea what this is about. Sure. Um, so I thought uh, it would be nice to have the music reference, some of the music that will be on the program. And so since you told me that Eliana will be playing the sixth suite, which is like the, probably the big chunk of the program, it's like a monumental, beautiful, beautiful piece. Uh, I started listening to it and then trying to see what could I use from this piece that could be part of my my new work. And the Gavotte number one really, really stood out to me uh, with its energy, its grace and, and the rhythmic uh, um, mo motif uh, that, you know, is so, just so delightful and and so then I had this idea of using that as a theme because it's short enough. I even shortened it a little bit further and uh, made it into a theme. And so it became like a theme and variations, but with the spin of not just any variations, but dance variations. So each variation is like a different dance. Um, and that dance, those dances are not necessarily, you know, just from the Baroque era, but dances that, you know, uh, emerged much later, like waltz or tango, or even there's a Polish national dance, Obedek, which is like a bow to, to my own, <laughs> uh, to where I'm from. And there's some other things too. So um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's not the music that I usually write, but uh, it, was, it was nice to go back to working with a little bit of tonality. I mean, obviously it's not like always just purely tonal, like there are some, some uh, extra elements here and there to to break the, from the you know uh, purely tonal world, but um, but yeah, so so that's that's going to be dance variations. And based on uh, gavotte, it in fact was a was a period dance in and of itself. So it's exactly dance variations based on a dance. Yes. So that's great. Yeah. So a dance suite that then is again other creates other dances um, that, you know, came later. <laughs> and that'll be for violin and cello, actually, right? Yes, yes, violin and cello. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I love writing for strings. Um, 
my previous two pieces that I wrote were also for strings. A string quartet um, that was premiered by the Daedalus last year and um, a solo double bass piece that was written for Tanglewood this past summer. So I've been spending a lot of time with with string, uh, writing for strings. And I love it because I think it has, I mean, for me at least uh, as a composer, I think it's the most, it, it has the most uh, possibilities in terms of sounds and techniques and you can just get anything you want with, with these instruments. Yeah. It's funny because you're a, I, I happen to know firsthand, you're a very, very beautiful pianist. Oh, um, I haven't played in a long, I haven't played since, I guess since our <laughs> coachings, oh. I mean, I mean, okay, maybe a year later I had to give another concert, but it's yeah, it's now like there's no more playing basically. Wait, is that because you don't have a piano, or you're just too busy? Both. I mean, we just moved to a new place, and the place is much smaller, so we had to sell the piano, um, and now I only have a keyboard. Oh. I know. <laughs> oh. Hey. No more piano, but I play at a church now every Sunday. The bathwater there. <laughs> I'm sorry. You talk about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> but it's 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 only temporary. It's it's not gonna be like that forever. Yeah. Pianos are not they're not that small. I'm looking at my piano over there. Uh, you have a grand, right? I have, I uh, yeah, I have a stock yeah. piano, so it's uh, you That's know great. it takes up a room. Basically. It does, yeah, yeah. You need a room for, for, for a piano. Yeah, large piece of furniture, a lot of wood, a lot of metal. Yeah. So, okay, so you, you referenced your, your background a little earlier. Um, and, you know, I'm always, I'm always so, uh, so pleased to talk about my own background. It's, you know, a mix of you know, Chinese on one side and Jewish on the other side, you know, raised in New York. But I think you've got me beat in terms of you know, exoticism and background. So can you talk a little about about this? Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's, it's I don't think I beat you in terms of that because I only have two as well. <laughs> I mean, I, my, both of my parents are Vietnamese, uh, born and raised, and then they moved to, um, to Europe, my mom to Russia uh, to continue her musical studies and my dad uh, to study engineering in Poland. So they then met in Russia and then, um, my mom came to Poland with my dad and, and that's where I was born. Uh, so I never lived in Vietnam. I only traveled there. I've traveled there many times to visit family. I still have extended family there. But I'm, but you know, I, I was born and raised in Poland and I lived there for 19 years. And then I came to the US for, to do my undergrad and I've been, I've been here since. So, so it's my seventh year now, I think, in the US, yeah. Would you consider yourself Polish or a Viet I guess uh, if you were American, you would be a Vietnamese American. So maybe you're a Vietnamese Pole, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I don't have uh, a Vietnamese nationality, um, only Polish. So, so I guess Polish makes more sense. But I do speak Vietnamese too with my parents, and uh, I, I, yeah, it, it's, it's. I, I wish it was. Uh, a bigger part of my life, but I mean, you know, it's it's hard when you live in a different country. And I mean, the fact that my parents made an effort to to teach me how to speak, read, and write. I mean, I, again, I don't read or write as well as I do in English, but uh, but at least I can I can read sl a little slowly <laughs> and and oh. and write. So that's 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 always something. That's great. Um, yeah, my dad came over. Well, I guess he made it over in 39. He'd moved to England first from China in 37. And, um, you know, basically 39, I think he was five, five years old or six years old in New York City. And so he grew up completely American, although his, you know, Chinese was spoken in the house. Um, but I didn't really, I didn't really, I didn't really get any of that. Uh, mm, so you do not speak the language? I don't speak any of it. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, I wish I had. I mean, we did, we had a lot of Chinese takeouts, but, <laughs> yeah. but, but I'm Jewish also. So, you know, that, that's <laughs> territory, right? Every, every Christmas, you know, dinner was, was with Chinese food, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, pretty common here from what I hear. 
Um, when, oh. when did your parents uh, leave, leave Vietnam and go to Europe then? My dad left when he was 18. My mom left when she was 14. Um, and uh, so I, the same I, early 70s, maybe? Or? Uh, maybe my dad in the 70s, my mom. No, no, no. Probably both in the 80s. Yeah, probably sometime in the 80s. Wow. So your parents grew up at a pretty intense period. In yeah, yeah. History. Yeah, yeah. During the war and then after war and yeah. <laughs> in the north, in the south, or where did they live? They're from the north. From the north. Yeah. <laughs> difficult for them to to leave Vietnam? Well, I mean, back then you, you had to, you know, it was very, it was very difficult to to study abroad. I mean, you had to. I think score very very high points at some national test exams to be able to to study abroad, um, and both of them were lucky enough to to get that, and so they left. Uh, my mom, especially at a very young age, I mean, fourteen is really young, and she's continued, you know, high school there, um, and then just kept on staying. And you know, there were long periods of time when she didn't see her family, and it was just like Russia. Yeah, she was in Russia. Where, where, uh, Moscow? Moscow, Moscow, yeah. Wow, so wait, she left by herself when she was 14? Yeah, I mean, there were other Vietnamese people too that, that were on the scholarship, I, I guess. That's how you can call it, a uh, scholarship to study uh, in Russia, you know, in math, in music, in, you know, different things. Um, my dad was studying marine engineering which I, I think Vietnam thought there was going to be war. So that's why they sent people to study specific things, you know, to build warships and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, yeah, <laughs> he didn't end up doing it after he graduated. Um, well, I guess both your parents, uh, they share that very, must be a very strong bond of, of shared history of, you know, being very independent, very young. And, uh, yeah pretty fierce I can imagine yeah yeah I mean but it was also you know viewed as such an opportunity to be able to leave um, and and further develop and you know um, so so it was a it was a great thing for them um, overall which is why I think you know it was also quite natural for me and my brother to to leave Poland and then you know go on to some other places too to pursue the best education that we can possibly have, yeah. And your mother is a, you said a musician, right? She's a composer? Yeah, so she also started out like me, so uh, studied piano uh, until the end of high school. And then when she started her undergrad and her master's, uh, and then in Russia, there's this extra degree that is not exactly called the doctorate, but it's called um, like professor at assistantship, something like that. So it's yeah, this the, the highest degree that there the, the, <laughs> that she said there was, and um, and and then it was all composition from her bachelor's on. Yeah, but she took a break. Um, actually, when she had me, she would still like go back and forth to Russia to like complete her exams for her for that degree, that final degree that she 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 was doing. And then after that, both of my parents didn't end up doing what they studied. Uh, they built a company. And after over a decade, my mom went back to, to composing. So now she's composing again. Um, yeah. And uh, I guess they're based in Warsaw, maybe? Uh, so my dad is in Warsaw. Uh, my mom, so they actually divorced, but my mom is now in Paris. So she's... Uh, yeah, sorry about that sound. Yeah, she's in Paris now. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a car alarm. This is, you know. <laughs> yeah. Wait, your uh, mom in Paris? She's in Paris now, yeah. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, her sister's family is there. Uh, my grandfather is there, so her dad is there. So so it's it's great for her to be again with her family. And she loves France and the French culture, so. Well, there's a, you know, a long Vietnamese yeah. link. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Which is why they sent me and my brother to a French school too when we were living in Poland. So you speak French, uh, native French? Used to, yeah. 
<laughs> Polish, native, uh, English. I mean, you barely even have an accent. English <laughs> and a bit of Vietnamese or sounds yeah. like you're not a Vietnamese. Yeah, no, I, I'm fluent in Vietnamese. I just don't write or, or read as as well as I as I would like. Uh, I I took German in school for a few years, Latin, and now I'm learning Greek. Oh wow! Yeah, Greek, I take. It. No, 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 no. Actually, modern Greek. My my boyfriend is Greek, so. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, all right, I've lost track, but that's uh, <laughs> a lot of languages. I love languages. Yeah. Oh, here's here's the question. I um. I, so I just can't resist. We, we eat a lot of Vietnamese food here. Oh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> we have, they even call there's a little neighborhood in Philly. I don't know if anyone actually calls it that, but I've seen it referred to as little Saigon. Oh. Uh, it's just a few, few blocks away. And it's, you know, all these, I, in this one, there's, you know, this huge Asian supermarket and there are five faux places within, within half a block actually. Nice. Um, and, there's this, I've read about Vietnamese cuisine. There's a whole kind of a, a mythological underpinning behind Vietnamese cuisine, different flavors, mixes and stuff. I mean, I don't know if you know anything about that. I don't know anything about it, but. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know too much about it, but I do, you know, I mean, Vietnam did does have like different parts, like the Northern, the Southern and, the, the northern pho is not the same as, as the southern pho. So, so there are some like differences uh, here and there. Um, so, so really the cuisine is not the same across the whole country. And there, there's the middle and then, you know, other uh, mountainous parts. It's, it's all over. Uh, but yeah, I, I have uh, not always loved. Yeah, please. Describe what, what if for anyone else listening, maybe up in Newburyport who might not know what, what uh, Pho. Yeah. Uh, you... Sure. So it has, it's basically a, a, a soup with uh, mostly beef broth. I think that's, that's the best kind. I mean, there's also the, the version with chicken, but uh, I think the most traditional one is with beef. Um, rice noodles that are kind of thick. Um, the, so the broth is like the really important part. And if you know how to make it, it has to be really free of any kind of fat. So it has to be really trans. The the, water, the broth has to be really transparent and um, and juicy, but without any of the fat. So you have to know the techniques to to make that um, to succeed in that. Uh, and and it has also some um, vegetables. So I have only learned that bean sprouts are in the southern pho, I think, but in the north they do not add bean sprouts. Um, and then. Of course, lots of onions, a bit of ginger. Uh, that's part of the broth. Um, I mean, it's it's really good. It it's that I, I feel like most Vietnamese food doesn't like when you eat when you get full, it doesn't feel disgusting. <laughs> like it's it's right, right. it's it's pretty light uh, overall still. So so that's that's good. <laughs> and we've done we've we've done these little uh, uh, individual tours of these of the various you know. Uh, faux places a few blocks away uh -huh. uh, and just compare the broth and it's it's amazing the variation yeah uh, but you know there's there's you know and we switch our allegiances from one to another depending upon how we're feeling but it's just amazing it's the most uh, I don't know how to describe it's just so comforting a huge bowl of, of noodles yeah. and then the broths are incredibly complex uh, yeah, yeah, it's complex, but at the same time, uh, light. I mean, people like to call it uh, also very light. Uh, and then, you know, people can also add uh, the sriracha sauce, or like as much to, to add, make it as spicy as you want. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's or, or we also can add a little bit of um, lemon to make it slightly more sour, either lemon or a bit of vinegar if you don't have lemon. <laughs> so. Have you ever tried? Try to cook it. It seems like it must be a yeah. I've, I've I've tried several times actually. Uh, it's it's not hard. It's it just takes a long time because again the broth really needs a lot of time uh, to 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 get that taste. So it's best if you cook it overnight on slow on like low fire. So it's just a bit time consuming, but uh, but it's not that hard. So. 
with your your background, just I guess so you grew up, you know, eating Vietnamese food, but also Polish um, food. Yeah, yeah, Polish food. All that different from a lot of uh, you know Jewish Ashkenazi cooking. I guess these kind of what uh, uh, I'm thinking of Ukrainian, but you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Kreplach or... or, or Latkes, is Latkes. that how you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We call them very differently. I have only learned about this term when I came to the US, but but we, we call them platski uh, zimniaczane, which means like potato pancakes. Um, I mean, it's just... So, uh, <laughs> you, know, you talk about... Yeah, it's amazing because I've... As much Vietnamese, Vietnamese food as I've had, you know, I've gone and you do feel... Unless you're, unless you're ordering some of the more Chinese dishes... Uh, in Vietnam, generally, you know, you feel quite good. Uh, even if you eat too much, you don't feel like, oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, exactly. Polish food. Oh, know, that, it's, it's very you filling. Feel, you, feel your, you feel your arteries. You know, <laughs> like you have to take a Lipitor af- afterwards <laughs> just to, you know, just to get up from the table <laughs> or something. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so good. I love Polish food as well. I mean, I, I also really enjoy that feeling of being feeling very full after like a big meal and you know it's usually a three course meal so you start with a soup then you have like the main course um which always usually has three parts like the meat the potatoes and uh, a salad or some kinds of greens um and and then dessert <laughs> yeah. sorry it's a token salad with all the, the meat in the stuff. yeah <laughs> yeah oh, Just... we got, like, some vegetables in there <laughs> yeah it's just too, yeah, 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 it's, uh, so it's, but I'm realizing that actually growing up with both of these two cuisines that are very meat heavy, I didn't, I didn't realize how much meat I eat you know, compared to a normal person because like in Vietnam, every dish has always meat and, and also, it, I mean, Polish food also, like if you want to think about like a real uh, dish, you know, like a meal it, it it's gonna be hard not to have meat so i think of vietnamese food is using meat a little more sparingly you know like the it might be broth and there might be a few slices of meat but it's not it's not a chunk of meat yeah 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 i think in in the american restaurants <laughs> here they they do like over overdo it with the amount of meat, I think. In, in, in the Vietnamese restaurants here in the US, like they, they don't give you enough, I don't know, noodles or, 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 or greens, but it's all, there's always a ton of meat. <laughs> um, so what I do then is that, you know, we take the food away, like we, we take the food home, we, we save some meat and then we make more noodles and, you know, cook the vegetables on the side. So there's an extra meal. <laughs> Them. Yeah. We used to do that uh, when we'd go out to a, a Jewish deli. You know, you order a sandwich and it's got literally, you know, four inches of meat. Uh, and, you know, there's this history behind that and, uh, you know, Jews experiencing want and, and, and things like that. And I think coming to the U.S., you know, it's like, you know, we, we, will, never, we will never starve again. Ever, yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but we would we take it home, and you'd have two more meals based on just one, you know, <laughs> strami sandwich. <laughs> so, so I'm watching this this uh, series, uh, Anthony Bourdain on on food called Parts Unknown. He's traveling all over, um, and I just started, and, and this last episode I watched, he's in Los Angeles, and he's talking to these Koreans. And there's this whole, uh, you know, Hispanic culture, Mexican in particular. And this is, as I understand, the birthplace of the, of this in- incredible uh, hybrid mix of, uh, of Korean tacos. Yeah, wow. So I, you know, which makes sense, you know, bim bim bop in a, in a taco shell, and then you put salsa on top or, you know, sour cream or whatever. Is there... Is there any chance for a Vietnamese Polish? Uh, I mean, could you, I guess, could you have pho with like Polish dumplings in it? Or are, is there any fusion there? Um, I mean, even in my cooking, mm. I don't always necessarily follow strictly, you know, the ingredients. I mean, it's whatever I have available in the fridge. And so then in the end, it, things always end up being a little bit 
mixed. Um, and I think the food that I cook, I mean, I do know a few uh, Polish, uh, uh, Polish recipes and also some Vietnamese ones, but I, I, I also really enjoy just, you know, cooking with the oven and just like whatever is around. I just, you know, lots of vegetables and then some meat. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pretty simple, but... Um, Greek then. Yeah, so I also have learned a few Greek dishes too, which, which, which is fun. I mean, it's surprisingly uh, similar to Italian, actually. Some of the, 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 the food I've tried, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like just a different version of a lasagna. <laughs> Like they have pastizio that, uh, okay, yeah. Um, but gosh, you've got, I mean, you've got, you know, Southeast Asia, uh, Northern Europe and Southern Europe. Uh, <laughs> just, boy, you'll never run out of things to eat. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. And, and my boyfriend and I, we also like to ex um, try different cuisines. Uh, so he really loves Peruvian food, for example, or... Uh, we, we love Indian food too. Oh my God, we just ordered <laughs> recently a lot of Indian food. Um, so, so it, like really, I, I think it's fun to to be exploring all these different cuisines. Uh, they really have, you know, so much uh, like different things to, to to enjoy. So, if you had if you had to choose one favorite food, I'm curious whole diverse i mean it's a ridiculous question of course yeah <laughs> but uh what what would you choose i love curry whether indian or thai or you know i just i just really love things that well meat of course i love meat but also uh, uh, that come with like a thick juicy sauce and i just love you know adding that over my rice and <laughs> so i would say i love curry all right, well, look, I, I could talk about, you know, food, obviously, for hours, which uh, we should probably discuss music a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, tell us a little about your, your, your music and, you know, maybe one thing that would be um, revealing is, is what are some favorite pieces of yours? Uh, you know, I asked actually some of, over the summer, I asked some of the other musicians and composers uh, to list five favorite pieces that they would take to Desert Island or something. And you know, it doesn't all have to be classical either. Um, so what would you choose as, as five favorite, favorite pieces of yours? I mean, first let me start by saying that it's, it's a really, really hard question. And like whichever piece I choose, I feel bad that there's no space for other pieces, you know. But um, let me look at, so, Okay, so I have here uh, different pieces that I like for different reasons. Um, one of them is uh, Berg's Piano Sonata. Opus One. Opus One, yeah. Uh, so his very first work that he wrote, I think when he was very young, 18 or 19. And uh, I mean, it's the piece is just uh, emotionally so so rich but also intellectually i mean you know you cannot add or take out any note or change any note to a, something else because then you would break the harmony and you would break this whole harmonic language that is so richly uh, so deeply embedded in, into the piece and which is so cohesive um so playing that is for me both like emotionally and also like intellectually satisfying um so that's one's answer. Um, do you want me to keep Alban, going? Uh, just to explain that, so Alban Berg, the, uh, the yeah. uh, Austrian composer, second Vienna school, this is around 1915, 1918, something like that, maybe? Yeah, something like that, I think, uh, yeah. Just, just um, uh, so yeah, I'm going to be putting links below um, to performances so people can listen and get you know, get an insight into you from what you like. Sure. Uh, maybe we'll even put a recipe for, for pho. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so another piece. Another piece. Um, I realized after mentioning, uh, writing down some of the pieces that they were all classical, which is not reflective of, all, of my taste, but anyway, I'll, I'll just go for it. Um, the Chopin Ballad number no. four is also a very special piece for me. Um, I actually didn't, start loving Chopin until 
I came to the US because in Poland everybody's playing Chopin and I think like you know it's it's a bit too much it's like people don't play <laughs> a lot of other music but um but I think Chopin is often uh sadly only associated for writing music that is only um you know about emotions and and like uh, being super romantic but it's actually so so well planned and it's i mean i actually analyzed uh his late works for my th uh, theory uh thesis um when i was at eastman so i did both composition and theory so i analyzed some of his works um and one of them was this ballad which i also played so it's it was just uh such a fantastic um journey to to be both first learning it as a performer and then later on going back and actually really examining every everything and the work that he does with the different melodic motifs is just really permeating all of his work i think he's uh yeah it's quite remarkable um so so anyway i think you know both you can analyze his music both from like um large scale like you know the big form which is this piece is an interesting hybrid between a variation and sonata form. Um, and then also to the little details, like all the, every variation, well, I mean, some in variation form, but every time the theme, there are two themes that get repeated. I mean, uh, especially one that is repeated a lot. Uh, like it's never really the same. And then at some point, this, there's this most beautiful part where he kind, kind of combines elements from both themes into one. And I think, you know, as a performer, we play that part and we're like, this is, this feels so good, but we, but, but that's because of the theory behind it, you know, like he really has planned everything uh, very thoughtfully. And, and so I really, I, I love the music that is, you know, satisfying on both ends um, that way. This is, all right, well, first of all, what's the, uh, before we get to my next question, what's, what's the key of that? It's the F form. minor. F minor. Yeah. So I, I'm curious, so as a composer with the theory uh, background, but also a, a, you know, a wonderful performing artist, although not in the last year. Yeah, or two. <laughs> this, this question comes up, um, frequently I find. So I'm, I'm very interested in theory, um, but you know, I don't have a degree in it. Uh, and it's been, a, it's been a long time since I studied it. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm playing a piece, I, I look at it, I analyze it, I, I, I uh, read up on it. And I do find it informs, it informs my understanding of the work. But I do have, I have run into colleagues who are just like, oh, you don't need to know any of that theory, and and you know, that's just for a bunch of pointy-headed people or or stuff like that. So I'm I'm curious, I'm curious for you as a performer and a composer, and a someone who studied uh, music theory in depth. What would what would you have to say to to musicians who, who say you don't need to know any music theory? I, I disagree with that. Uh, I disagree because I think um, the more you know, um, the more conscious you can be in your playing. And as a performer, you have to know what you're playing. Um, you know, if you want to convey the same, an idea that actually is a, trans, is a transformation of a previous idea. And uh, I think your performance can be so much more enhanced by just being aware of that, of those things, or like being aware of the of the form, you know, from large scale to small scale uh, details. I mean, obviously, you know, we don't have to spend more time maybe studying the piece and practicing it, but, but, but I, I personally, as a composer, I always like to see, oh, how did this person do this or that, you know, like, I guess it's just like my composer brain wants to dissect <laughs> everything so that I can then, um, yeah, just understand better, like the, 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 the work process of, of how these pieces are being made. It's interesting when you, how, when you think of something, when you're playing, if you think of it differently, then you might, you know, there might be something very subtle that you then play differently. Uh, I remember, well, it actually was just, what day is today? <laughs> I, remember, I think Saturday, yeah. So it was yesterday, I was coaching a group 
and the pianist, uh, what was this? Uh, Beethoven G minor cello piano sonata. I think the second sonata maybe. And the pianist played one passage and then the next measure, uh, she did another passage. And the first one is very simple. And the second one has a sound that's, it's just a little, I, I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to describe it to her, her other than, than it, the first one is kind of like, ah, oh, and the second one's like, hmm. You know, it kind of sounds like, it's like, it's a little skeptical. Um, and I said that and she was just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and I was, tr I was trying to, I, I, you know, it was a failure on my part as a teacher. I, I couldn't, you know, the problem with music is, is uh, you know, the problem with music and the, the wonderful thing about music is it's, uh, you, you can put it in, you, you cannot put it into words because, yeah. because it's music. Yeah. In the words, you wouldn't have to have the music. So, uh, but then it, it, it's a dilemma when you're trying to say, you know, do this differently. Um, and it's like, well, okay, so faster or slower or louder or softer or louder on this one note. It's like, well, it's not just that. But I it's, find it's the I'm attitude as well. I mean, one thing that I find, you know, is like you could be playing the same notes, but you, if you don't have the right... I mean, attitude, is, I don't mean like a bad attitude, but like a certain mindset. Uh, it's not only enough to play soft, but it has to be maybe like soft and intense or soft and like relaxed, you know, like all these little subtleties that I I really care about actually when my musician, when the performers are playing my work because uh, it's like, this is not the right character that I'm looking for. And, and those things are very hard to put into words. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I mean, it comes up in, I guess it's even more, I don't know, maybe more subtle. I, I, I think it was this movie I saw, it might have been 25 years ago. I think it might have been Chocolat or something like that. And there was, there was a, a, a woman cooking and she was, she was putting her love into the, into the food. Uh, I'm not sure that's what the movie was, but you know this idea that that uh, you know it, it, does that make sense or is this just ridiculously romantic and it's like oh okay it sounds good, but really you put two plates next to each other and one was cooked with love and one wasn't uh, you know can you can you taste the difference right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then but then maybe if 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 I don't know I I don't know I don't. Know. <laughs> You know, at some point, of course, it can be just too much. It's like, okay, you know, it's enough. <laughs> All right, um, so, um, geez, we only got to two pieces. Okay, okay, okay let me, let me uh, go faster. So another one is a new piece by um, a colleague of mine. I mean, he just graduated from Penn. Um, he'd be very flattered if he knew that I <laughs> mentioned his piece. Uh, it's a piece that was... Uh, played by the Daedalus Quartet called uh, Alpha Lens Centauri, I think. I, I will I will attach a link. It's for String Quartet. And uh, it's just a gorgeous piece. I mean, Wait, like when I... Composer? Uh, Joshua Hay, sorry. Yeah, Joshua Hay. Oh, okay. Sure. Do you know him? Have uh, you? I know him in, indirectly. Uh-huh. Yeah, I love his music. And uh, this piece in particular, I think... Uh, like he uses again the strings and to me at least it sounded like in such a new way I mean it um, yeah it's just like I told him once like you're, this piece sounds beautiful without trying to be beautiful you know it's just kind of exists and um, but it's yeah it, it, it's really gorgeous uh, so I'll, I'll just let you and others uh, listen to that to it um, I, I like this idea of beautiful without trying to be beautiful. Uh, it's funny. It just I, exists, yeah. Going back to Chopin, I, you know, his, I, I, his music is, is so romantic, but like you were saying, I find um, everything's in its, it's in its place. Um, and an example for me, at least, of a composer who is also very romantic, but it's, it's, it's a little excessive. Yeah, I find is Tchaikovsky, who I I I'm moved by. Yeah, but but I I 
I sometimes feel, I, I sometimes feel the, the hand of manipulation is a, it's a bit too much. Heavy. It's yeah. like, okay, we'll build this up. It's a huge climax and then we'll let you down. And then builds up. It's like, oh, another, another huge climax, even bigger climax. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, then, and so there's a and then the huge climax, you know, <laughs> F, 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 you know, you know five fortes. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not just as loud as you can believe, but you know, and it's like, you know, at some point, you know, it's like, it's, it's a bit too, yeah, no, I, I, I totally understand what you mean. Versus Vietnamese food. <laughs> so just a little like, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree, which is why I was so t- taken by that piece when I heard it. Uh, yeah, it was just something that was so unassuming and, uh, and yet so beautiful, you know, without trying to manipulate the listener in any way. Uh, but yeah, like the, the different techniques that he explores on the strings just sound so beautiful. And, and, you know, it's in those cases where I find, you know, like that's really where all those extended techniques can come into play when they actually really make sense in the music. Uh, not just like, oh, we can do this. And there's also that that one can do on the instrument, which is fine too. I mean, it's, it's a way to explore the instrument, but in this piece in particular, I think all of those techniques serve the music uh, for, you know, their foremost. Um, well, can you explain for, for people who might not know what extended techniques means? Uh, sure. Um, so it's like uh, it, um, any, tech, any type of playing that doesn't involve just like, you know, normally playing the notes as, as you know, post-classical music is, you know, I'm going to play an arco, so like using the bow, hair of the bow, or like pizzicato, is, all this is pretty standard, but an example of an extent technique would be, uh, I don't know, um, playing um, like circular bowing so that it creates like no pitch sound, it's just like kind of like that. Um, you know, different different things that you can do with the bow <laughs> or, or, or adding other objects to the instrument to, to make weird sounds, um, sure, anything. That's uh, <laughs> yours, right? You know, using the wood of the bow or, or uh, you know, even knocking on the instrument yeah. with your fingers or, or something like Black Angels, you know, reversing you, you bow where your fingers are and you finger where the bow are and you get this you know, really eerie sound or exactly or, uh, you know, playing on the bridge or even behind the bridge so that yeah kind of crazy you know I, I kind of silvery sound or even an itchy sound right yes 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 yes, so yes. extended techniques uh, so and yeah they can become sometimes you get young composers who are using them and it's just it it looks like it's kind of a uh, grocery list. It's like, oh, look, look how many weird techniques I can use, as opposed to using these techniques in the service of expression. And yeah, then... yeah, absolutely. All right, so that's three. That's three. Okay, one more, uh, two more. I really like uh, the Beethoven Piano Sonata Opus 109, third movement. Um, third movement is the one that has uh, theme and variations. Um, so the reason why I love this piece so much or this movement particular so much is because of like the whole emotional journey that starts from beginning until the end and at the very end he goes back to the theme uh but it's like after everything that has happened in between you know it's not no longer the same it feels like you know the person or whoever uh protagonist has matured and you know there's an extra lower bass in in the left hand and uh it's it's like it's a beautiful piece and I always enjoy listening to it and playing it. Um, and then another piece. Wait, so the, uh, yeah. you know, just to, as a composer, <laughs> it's interesting because, um, you know, music, music, music is linear, right? It exists in time. Um, but at the same time, certainly as a composer, uh, you'll, look, you'll look at music as a, you know, as a structure. Uh, you said sort of think something like Bartok's fourth quartet or the fifth quartet were in, in an arch form. Um, and this, you know, looking at something like, you know, Beethoven 109, the variations, and it, you know, starting again, starting out with a theme and then going through variations of it and then returning back to the theme, this idea of it kind of anchored 
on two yeah. sides by one or the other. But of course, you don't experience like that. You experience yeah. as going through, and then it's transformed. I mean, it, yeah. it's interesting because composers are trained to look at it, you know, as a as a whole. At the same time, composing something that that you you want to experience in in time, right? Yeah. And, uh, it's, you know, when you come, it's like the Schubert F minor Fantasia, right? When that, that uh, theme, you know, reappears again, you know, two thirds of the way through and then it comes back and it's, and then it changes and it's different. And it's, and uh, you know, all, sorry, all the hairs in the back of my neck are going up just even thinking about that, that, that experience of, of this theme coming back. And even if it's completely the same notes, all of a sudden now it's different because you've heard it, you've gone through this whole journey before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, exactly. So uh, that's exactly how I, you know, uh, by the end you, you get to that theme again, you feel so exhausted after having played everything that was in between, but at the same time, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's just so well written. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's one of my, my favorite pieces. So, I mean, that's the other thing, as a performer, especially, you know, a large scale work uh, like, like that, you know, the, the, there's an experience for the listener watching the, the, the performer, this, this, the struggle, the visceral struggle with this piece. Um, and, you know, you sweat, sweat running off and just, just, you know, I mean, you have to sit there for, for 20 minutes, but, but, uh, but then the, the performer, the pianist, has to has to go through this for 20 minutes and it is yes it, it is it's exhausting i mean i'm imagining yeah. i don't play piano i wish i played piano but I, <laughs> you know i boy this, you know going through a, a large-scale beethoven piano sonata and then coming coming the coming around you're you're personally transformed yeah by, uh, as the performer yes 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 and i'm sure it will also be different to you every time you come back to the piece, you know, 10 years later or 20 years later, uh, every time you come back, you start to, ex you, you hear things differently. You also experience things differently, of course, after having uh, gone through more in life. So, so all, it, it's really beautiful to, you know, be still playing the same music, but uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not that, that old yet, but <laughs> I imagine it would be, um, you know, uh, that I would enjoy just as much, if not more, to go back to it and, and, and play it, so. Well, there are pieces like that, right? Um, I mean, for me, any Beethoven string quartet or, or you know, um, well, I almost anything by Beethoven, but, uh, you know, I've, I've lived with these for the last, last, you know, 40 or 50 years, and you come back to it again, you perform it again, and it's, and it's, you know, it's wonderful and you discover new things. Yeah. Then there's, there's some music that I, I remember like in high school, I just loved and I listened over and over and over again. And then I kind of forgot about it. And then 15 years later, I listened to it. It's like, mm, mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that happens too. I don't think, I think so. <laughs> that happens too. Yeah, I have, I also had, I mean, not just with music, but with other things, with books or with movies. Uh, you know, you, you, you remember having a very good impression of something and then, you know, it's in your, in your mind, it's something completely different by now, like after all these years of idealizing it. And then when you actually go back to it, it's like, huh, is that really what I was so crazy about? So yeah. I, I, I really, I can relate. Well, that, that's happened to me with my daughters a lot with, with movies because their movies, I, I just thought were, oh, they were so amazing in high school. I was like, you guys have to watch this. And we sit down and they're like, oh, we don't want to watch another one of your stupid old movies. Like, no, 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 really, you're going to love this. And we sit and we watch it and I'm like, oh, <laughs> this, this really isn't very good. And they're like, yeah, this isn't very good. And you're like, oh, my God. You know, <laughs> you know, it happens. It happens. It you know, happens. They break your heart and, and, uh, and you love them anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, last piece, fifth piece. Last piece, okay, okay. Uh, so I put down the Shostakovich Piano Concerto number two, uh, second movement. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I really love this. I, I often go back to this movement uh, because, I mean, again, it's an emotion that I think is really hard to describe in words. It's this feeling where you 
I mean, at least for me, how I interpret it is, you know, Shostakovich obviously had a very difficult life um, in living in Russia during uh, during that era, and you know, he was he was asked to write music that would uh, be fitting with the political agenda and all of that. So. Um, you know, a lot of his music is very sarcastic, it's, it's so grotesque, but in this particular movement, I feel like we really get a bit of a glimpse to, to himself, and, and it's, you know, after, he, it feels like he has kind of almost given up on everything, and this is like what has remained of him, which is both very sad and hopeful, a little bit hopeful at the same time. It's, it's such a beautiful emotion. Like it, it's, it's not just like plainly sad or, or happy, you know, like it, it's, it's, it's a very complex emotion and the music is so simple, so, so simple, uh, but it doesn't need anything more. Uh, so I, I, I just really like, like it when music is simple, but it, it has so much uh, substance or, or something really that grabs onto you, so. You know, here's a question about Shostakovich. I mean, right, he, he suffered terribly. And you hear that in his music. Yeah. And it's, it's arguably what, uh, it's, it's one of the things that makes his music so extraordinary. Um, you know, if, if, if he hadn't gone through that, um, what would his music have been like? Uh, you know, is it, is it necessary, you know, what, I mean, was it necessary for, I mean, I guess it was for him to be, to be who he was, he had to endure that terrible hardship. Um, but I'm trying to think of composers who had pretty fairly easy, relatively easy, you know, kind of happy lives. Uh, I think of Haydn as one, <laughs> though he didn't have a very good marriage, you know, but, uh, oh. you know, I, I guess he, he made up for it in other ways, maybe. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, is it, is it, I'm asking you as a composer, do you think is how, is it important to have, have, have suffered in order to write great music? Um, I mean, whether it's great or not, maybe it's, I don't know about that, but I'm sure, I think as, as composers or artists in general, um, it's, it's really important to, I think, experience as much as, as possible uh, because you cannot write about things without having gone through anything, right? Like, I mean, then you don't have anything interesting to say. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but, um, but I, 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 don't, I, I think at least, you know, you have to experience a variety of things, not just like one, the same thing, um, the same life or, you know, that has nothing happening. Um, but again, it, I don't know if there's, there's a right answer to this question. It wouldn't be enough to just kind of uh, seal yourself in a cloister and, and just compose, you know, from an early age. Yeah, no, I think you have to travel, you have to experience a lot of other art, read a lot, go to museums, um, you know, I mean, get involved with, with a lot of things that are outside of just music, you know, because then I think your music becomes so much richer, more informed, uh, and also being inspired by other art forms is also a wonderful thing. I mean, yeah, I, th I think you have to know the balance between actually, you know, like spending time writing, but also living so, so you can then write after. Well, okay, so um, one last question for you related to that then is, if you couldn't be a composer or a, or a musician or a pianist or a music theorist, uh, if you couldn't do music, what, would you, what, what do you think you would like to do? Uh, I, I love languages if I could get paid for <laughs> studying languages I don't know if that thing exists uh, that would be one of my two answers the other one is um, I would love to study something that is related to preserving the environment uh, I feel like that that work would really make me feel more that, that, that you know I'm actually making a real impact which you know right now we're in this crisis of 
of uh, <laughs> of uh, climate change and, and and all of that. And I would love to just do anything, either do something to cons to conserve, uh, uh, you know, preserve, conserve uh, animals or or um, sorry, endangered species uh, or like plant trees or, or whatever, you know, way or form. Um, I think that would be give a lot of meaning to uh, to my <laughs> life. <laughs> Well, maybe there's some way of, I suppose, uh, bringing that into your music at some point also. Yeah. Who's yeah. the composer? Is it uh, John Luther Adams, right? Not John Adams, but John Luther. I think John Luther Adams, maybe, the, the, the up in Alaska, right? Who writes these pieces that are deeply kind of uh, environmental in many mm -hmm. ways and also very beautiful, very, very directly inspired. Uh, by, by nature, mm -hmm. uh, certainly Sibelius, right? You think of Sibelius, I yeah. instantly think of, of uh, forests and lakes and, and, and Finland, right? Yes. I mean, some yes. composers are more kind of nature than others. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, Brahms would take walks in the, in, you know, in the country, but I don't, I don't think of Brahms and immediately think of, you know, forests or mountains or stuff like that. <laughs> right. I wonder other, Trying to think of other composers, but we're, um, you know, Gershwin, very, very, the city, right? Right, right, right. Copeland and, you know, the Plains, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the Kansas and stuff like that. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, uh, people get inspired by different settings and each is exciting in its own way. But uh, I have, I have found that, you know, I really like being, uh, close to plants. I mean, we have bought plants recently, and uh, what, one of your questions: What do you do to keep yourself sane during the pandemic? I love just observing my plants every day and seeing how much they have grown. You know, compared to the previous day. I don't know. These little things really bring me a lot of joy. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Yeah, I have this. Um, I was never. My mother, despite being a, a garden writer, actually. Um, I don't know, plants, they never really, I didn't really get it. And, uh, and then I, I have a, upstairs, I, I put in a green roof on, on the second floor of my, my townhouse. In down nice. And I, I've, I've been kind of, I, I've been really surprised how just looking out at that, and seeing, I mean, it's all kind of indigenous little plants, these little kind of uh, mid-Atlantic succulents and stuff. Yeah, and yeah. It, it's not something that you have to spend a lot of work on, but it's something right. natural. Yeah. And watching them grow and spread, because, you know, they just got planted three years ago, or well, four years ago. And, and then it's, ah, it's so, it's just a profound satisfaction and just almost a delight from yes. looking at these plants. <laughs> I know exactly. Yes, that's that's like, that's exactly it. Uh, seeing it, you know, grow and 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 change over time. I mean, it's it's just weirdly satisfying to know that oh, it's it has a life of its own. <laughs> it's not just an object that stays the same, you know. Uh, so, and then you have to take care. I mean, okay, I, not all of my plants need a lot of care, but but uh, it's still fun when you actually do know you can affect its growth or things right. like that. Right, right. So. No, I, I inherited a, an aloe plant from. from well, I have one too. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a full. I mean, it's huge. And, and, and I brought it back to Philly, and it's, it's doing okay, but it's clearly. Doesn't uh, like it as much. Maybe it's pining away from my mother or something. Uh, but you know, you come down, and it's you know, I, I can't figure out if it, you know, am I overwatering it because it's aloe, or am I. Is it not getting enough water? Does it need more light or less light? And, yeah. you know, you see it, it's not thriving. And I'm a little bit like, you know, oh, you know, baby, you know, <laughs> what, what, what's wrong? What, tell, tell me, you know, talk to me. What yeah. So. Yeah, if aloes really don't like to be overwatered. So make sure after you water, and it's, I think you should water only like once every three weeks. Oh, three uh, weeks. Okay. Yeah, I mean, especially in the winter, you, have to, you, you don't have to water as frequently. Um, but yeah, make sure it has a lot of light. I also had an, an aloe, have still an aloe, and one day after I watered it, you know, um, 
the drainage I think didn't work very well. Make sure it, it's, it has like a hole at the end so that the water drains out. Otherwise the, the roots will rot. Uh, and so I could see actually my leaves becoming more gray, you know, a few days later and I, I freaked out. And so I, I, yeah, I changed that side to face the sun. I don't know, but it, 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 it has slowly, it's slowly recovering from, from that. Um, I might have to have you over to, <laughs> I'm looking at it over there. So, yeah. So, all right, at that, we should probably wrap this up. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. So the concert is December 20th, Sunday at three o'clock. It's going to be streaming on the, uh, on the website uh, or maybe the Newburyport, at NewburyportChamberMusic.org. Uh, or there'll be a link to it on our YouTube channel. I'm not quite sure how that's done. We're, we're doing um, voluntary contributions in three levels. I think it's $10, $20, and $30. Last, last I checked, that might have changed. Um, but, you know, we want as many people who can, who can listen. Um, we, we want to listen, so we don't want price to be an object. Uh, and Narit and Eliana will be recording it in St. Paul's Church in Newburyport, which will be empty, uh, except for me, who, who will be, you know, will be actually recording it. Uh, and then probably edited by Alessandra, my daughter. Uh, oh, my daughter. great. And uh, yeah, full family affair there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be wonderful to be up in Newburyport again, socially distanced, of course. Yeah. Of course, right. Very important. On masks and everything but uh yeah i can't wait that's to awesome hear hear your new work uh, i think it's what's it called dance variations yeah i might change the title i'm still thinking uh about it i mean it was just like I, yeah it's dance variations for now but it might it might change okay. might <laughs> to be announced then. yeah to be announced okay thank you so much for this thank you very much and uh if I don't see you around in person, I guess I'll, we'll, we'll be in touch and I'll, I'll see you around virtually. Then. Yes, sounds great. So Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you.